Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when or where you're watching this webinar. Uh, the topic of the webinar for today is integrated method, arc flash energy calculations and applications. My name is Afshin Majd. My contact information is, uh, my email address is my first name, afshin at easypower.com. And my extension is 61. So today we are going to focus on uh, integrated method in Easy Power software package, talking about the advantages of this method, why we came up with uh, this method, what this method offers that other methods don't, and for what applications it would be a good tool to be utilized. Before I get more into the details and the overview slide, which is the next slide, let me bring up the Easy Power screen real quick here and go over some introduction, some uh, dis discussions about the Easy Power. And um, for example, if I go to uh, short circuit uh, focus and I choose short circuit options, then going to arc flash hazard, as you see, calculate arc flash using, uh, you can use either momentary, interrupting, 30 cycle, or, in or integrated. So you can use any of these four methods. And uh, integrated method would be the one that we will focus on today. If you use momentary or interrupting or 30 cycle, the software is going to use a fixed value which happens to be one of these three to calculate the arc flash energy and incident energy and other outputs related to arc flash. If I close out of this window here and keep momentary, let's say for arc flash, these are the three different options that I mentioned, half a cycle, five cycle, 30 cycle. And if I turn them off one by one, half cycle, let me, if I fault this bus here, this would be the half cycle value. I turn on a five cycle value and I turn on 30 cycle values, and I can see them here. For a utility, these three values will be the same because it's a stiff grid. It is not going to change because the utility keeps contributing regardless of uh, changes in the system. For other type of sources, including generators and motors, as you can obviously see here, uh, half cycle is the largest current, and this current decays or drops or decreases as time progresses. So over the time, you would notice that five cycle value is lower than half cycle and 30 cycle is the lowest for this case it happens to be zero so this is just an introduction and laying um, the foundation in terms of why uh, even we uh, came up with this idea what was the reason behind coming up with the idea of having a different method other than half cycle five cycle or 30 cycle currents uh, something that we refer to as an improved method or integrated method. If you have a fault at the utility bus, the currents remain the same. However, anywhere else, as long as you have motors and generators contributing, this current decays. And the value of the current, the amplitude of the current, depends on the trip time. So if there is a trip time within half cycle, then the current value would be this. And if, if it's something closer to five cycle, this would be the current. And anything closer to 30 cycle or larger, no contribution from the motor. So it brings up, it raises the question that whether or not it's a good approach to assume that during the arc flash calculations, regardless of the trip time, we use one of these values and we keep them unchanged because when the engine uses any of these values, this is not gonna change over the time of the simulation. So I'm kind of, um, talking about the deficiency of the already existing these three methods and what, wh why and why we even thought about another method which is called integrated. So it's very important to know that when we do dark flash calculations, these values are not going to change. So here, again, back to the point, you can see that, uh, for example, for a utility, if I have a fault here, uh, the values for half cycle, five cycle, and 30 cycle wouldn't change. But if I have a fault here, as an example, these are short circuit issues that we most probably know. I just go over them as a review. You would imagine that uh, for, uh, let's say, half a cycle, this is the contribution from the motor. Five cycle, the contribution goes lower. And for 30 cycle, the contribution goes even lower. So that being said, uh, just to give you guys an introduction, I take the screen um, to the other side and let's um, look at the, uh, these topics of 
um, to just a general overview of what is planned to be covered here. We will talk about the introduction of our flash energy calculation in software packages, easy power, integrated method. Uh, we will also uh, <coughs> talk about the uh, comparison of different methods, which I talked about. The renewable plant is an example, which is just happens to be an example for um, renewable energy. This also is the example that I used in my previous webinars. Uh, I did one or two webinars in the past on the renewable energy, specifically on renewable energy. I intentionally used a very similar setup here, which again, it, it's not really limited to that setup. As long as you understand the approach and how easy power utilizes this method, it's not limited to any type of um, setup. It could be a renewable, could be a fossil fuel uh, plant, it could be any type of plant. It's just a different arc flash method that the software will use. Uh, and then there would be another example that I use also um, that's more about the large motors. So uh, that being said, Let's go to the next slide. Um, so introduction to arc flash calculations and uh, in software packages in general. Let's take a quick look uh, in, uh, to, let's, let's take a quick look at uh, how different software packages uh, approach this issue. Uh, what information they need, what type of processing they do, what are the uh, typical outputs. So arc flash calculations. Um, in an arc flash calculation, the following steps have to be followed. Um, so Regardless of what type of package we're using here, uh, very much I'm using Easy Power as an example, and it's a showcase on Easy Power. It's, it goes into a lot of details for Easy Power, but it would be good to know generally, in general, what goes on um, in other software packages, or anybody wants to write, you know, kind of a small piece of code, uh, what information he needs, uh, and what steps he needs to follow. Uh, number one is calculation of the bolted fault current on the bus. So all, all of us know that uh, you can't perform arc flash study if you don't have short circuit results. So the short circuit results have to be calculated according to all the standards in the industry or a common practice. Uh, you always need a three-phase bolted fault current. So regardless of what method or approach we use here, it has to be a bolted fault current, which means that three phases, A, B, C, fault, and um, that value has to be provided as an input to arc flash calculations. Then we need to consider a applicable code or a standard, 1584 for voltages less than 15 kV and you know those conditions and requirements that are, are uh, covered in 1584 standard are is one example. If there are other codes, if there are uh, standards, they can be utilized very much. But 1584 is the one that all the arc flash experts uh, will know it very well. So let's just use this method as an example here um, so that we can cover issues that are very well known to everybody. And then, you know, it makes it much easier to understand and follow the concept, just the concept. So 1584, let's assume that becomes the reference here. And uh, then the other issue that there are a lot of details here, but as an example, you would need, if you want to calculate the arc flash results for a bus, you would need, according to 1584, you would need to know if that bus is grounded or no, just the grounded, uh, grounding configuration of that bus, uh, you would need to know that. So that being said, you know, the bolted fault current, again, it could be a value that comes from different standards. It can come from IEEE, it can come from ANSI, it can come from IEC, it uh, can come from different methods to calculate, but it becomes an input to arc flash calculations. After the bolted fault current is calculated, there are several ways to calculate the device trip time. So now that uh, we would uh, start moving uh, from the short circuit area, or domain or a scope little by little into arc flash scope, which means uh, we collect all the information of the short circuit and the values are there. Um, then they have to be plugged in into the system. Um, and if you have a system, and again, that, you know, it be just to uh, visualize it, just to show you as an example, um, I br bring back this easy power file here. Um, you would see that, for example, if you have a fault here, I double click that again to make sure that uh, this is my fault values here. Let's just turn off uh, five and 30 cycle values. So uh, this value of 15, let's say 15.9.84 Ka uh, is the short circuit contribution to this bus. So that's my, bolted fault current value. 
coming to this bus. The second thing that we need to know is the uh, protective device trip times. So, for example, here this relay becomes my trip time and becomes my protective device. What I need to know is that how long time it takes for this relay to trip this time. And all of us who are familiar with uh, TCCs and uh, coordination studies and protective devices would immediately know that you would need a TCC. So you plug in the value, you look at the TCC of that device, and that should give you that should give you the time needed for this protective device to interrupt this current. So that's uh, that's the most common approach that people use to calculate the trip time device. But regardless of the details of it, regardless of what type of relay it is, um, going through the steps, number one, you need the bolted fault current on the bus. Number two, you would need the trip time. Uh, one little thing that I left out here is the bus, the current, the total fault current on the bus is not necessarily equal to the fault current coming from this branch. It might be different as it is right now. You can see here because you have more than one branch contributing to that uh, specific bus. What it means is that now you have to go to every single individual contributing branch and see if there is a protective device. And if there is, if there is a protective device, how long time it takes for that protective device to trip. So um, that's one thing. And there is one little thing that I left out here again, and that's these are the short circuit values. These are the bolted fault current values. These are not necessarily arcing current. And if, you, if I go back to my presentation here, as you um, notice in the previous slide, I mentioned that 1584 could be one of the standards. So if 1584 or any other standard is the reference here, once we have the bolted fault current, Based on that standard, we have to find a way to calculate the arcing current in that branch, either in that branch or in that bus. But the fact is that in order to calculate the arcing current in that branch, you should start from the bus. So um, one more time, let's just review this, the steps here. Um, bolted fault current here, this value, we need to calculate the arcing current from this value, then we need to go and look at the contribution contribution from each individual branch. That's the concept of any arc flash calculation, regardless of what type of tool, what type of package, what type of software we use here. So 24.248 becomes the bolted fault. It's in KA, just um, to let you guys know, um, if you're familiar with easy power, you would know that it's in Ka, otherwise here is where you would see this value. This is a Ka value. So this is the value of the short circuit on this bus. These are the contribution from different buses, from different branches that I have. And then the next step becomes, let's just go back again, calculating the arcing current. So after bolted fault current is calculated, there are several ways to calculate the device trip time. I talked about it already. Codes and uh, standards don't necessarily address how to calculate trip time of protective devices. Um, different algorithms can be used to calculate the device trip time, which we talked about that one as well. Based on the code, the arcing current can be calculated from the bolted fault current. This is something that, you know, up to this point, I covered it. So I have my bolted fault current contribution values, arcing current, which you don't see it here, but you would be able to see it if you look at the arc flash results. For example, I can go here. It might be a little bit premature and early for me to jump to the results. These results are just for the sake of um, you know, showing a visual or visualizing the, the concept so that you can follow uh, the example. So boss bolted fault current value. Um, let me just fault this here. Uh, let me just go to short circuit options or flash values, make sure that I choose, let's say, momentary, apply, okay. And then, um, now for this case, you would see that my bus has a total bolted fault current of 24.248. You can see that value here. There are a whole lot of other details here that they all come into play when you pick the um, appropriate code and a standard, the, the, the applicable code and a standard, something that 
the user chooses that one. But for this case, we assumed 1584. So, voltage fault current then comes in our current that is where this is the bridge, this is the gap that only that code or standard um, fills for us. So, how do I get from this number to this number? The answer for this example is 1584, IEEE 1584. Or if there is any other standard, that's how we calculate the arcing current from the voltage fault current values. So based on the code, the arcing current can be calculated from the voltage fault current, which we discussed about that one. Now, going back to the, the, the point that we got here is going back to that concept of the arcing current if i have a bolted fault current of 24.248 here as we notice here the arcing current value is less than this value or equal to this value i mean i'm not going to comment on that part depending on the code but it's different from this value most of the cases at least there would be a process that from this value we would go and calculate a bus uh, arcing fault current in this case, it happens to be 23.182 20, uh, kM. Uh, so this is the value here, the total arcing current here. The second question becomes, okay, how do I calculate the trip times? In order to have the trip times, we need these values. These values, if you remember here, are my momentary, are my momentary currents, and they're not the arcing currents. So you cannot use them to calculate the trip time for the device so you need a process you need an approach you need a few steps in order to translate this value to an arcing current from each branch you already know the total arcing current for the bus you need to figure out how to translate that to currents that come from different branches there could be a few different approaches i'll look at them as we move forward but one good method would be looking at this total current dividing this value by this value coming up with the percentage value and then put a percentage value for each branch obviously this branch has zero percentage this guy has something closer to one over six this guy is 15 over 24 almost this guy is again very similar to this value so you put a percentage value on this one so zero percent let's say this guy becomes I'm just giving a number 10 20 percent this guy becomes let's say 70 percent 10 20 percent here they have to add up to 100 percent using those percentage values you can then after calculation of the bus arcing fault current you can use the same percentage value as a ratio and assign contribution to different branches that would be the easiest way that you can think of let's say 4.132 divided by 24.248 is almost 17 percent it is almost 17 percent so 17 percent here then you would go and get this value of 23.182 multiplied by 17 percent that can become the contribution arcing current contribution from this branch here so that's one way of doing that so let's just go back to the presentation again then we have the arcing current brand going through each branches and after that we can use the uh, we can use the tcc of each protective device here for example for this branch it becomes this protective device for this branch becomes this protective device and calculate the trip time for that protective device for that specific branch. So that would be the step that we need to take. Depending on the number of branches, the fault current should be divided among all branches which are directly connected to that faulted bus. Different methods can be used here. This can be used to calculate the trip times from that point, which these are all the options that I already covered. So I just read through and you know move on. From that point, the device which takes the longest to trip parallel branches can be used to calculate the incident energy. One conservative, conservative is one of those terms that I use it very cautiously when it comes to our flash results, but uh, one conservative approach is to use the total arcing current and the longest trip time. So just let me just clarify myself uh, on this term of the con you know, conservative that I use here. Looking at different branches, 
we talked about the bolted fault current, then arcing current on the bus, then using a method to calculate the contribution from different branches. From that point, going to protective devices, calculate the trip device, trip time for each trip device for each branch. And then you would imagine that, you know, depending on the trip time, you would have to see when the contribution to this point becomes absolute zero. That is when the last trip device or the slowest trip device or the, the one that takes the longest trips. Once that guy trips, then there would be no contribution and this current at this bus goes to absolute zero. Um, then from that point on, we have to go back and see, okay, this is the time required to extinguish the fault and how much current, uh, pick up the formulas and calculate the incident energy. Again, I kind of described point A, point B, I didn't go into much details. Uh, that depends on the type of a standard. But the last sentence that I had here, if you look at it, I say one conservative approach is to use the total arcing current and the longest trip time. So depending on what type of approach we're going to take here, and that's the point, the whole point about this presentation, that one approach that I can use here is that I would imagine, I would assume, I would assume that the current on this bus, during the entire time that all the trip devices are tripping, remains the same. Uh, that value, if you remember, was 23.182. It is very clear by now that this is not a very strong and very good assumption, but this is an assumption and, and can be used. Um, what happens is that um, that is the time, that is the time that the slowest or the trip device which takes the longest will trip. The question is that before then, has any other trip device tripped? And the answer for very obvious reasons is yes. Um, one of them, two of them, maybe three of them, if this is going to be the longest one, then you would go back and question, why do we assume 23, 1, 8, 2, this value remains the same? Because in fact, it doesn't. Every time that one of the trip devices trip or a contributing um, motor or generator uh, stops contributing, there would be a change in the current. And that change is not being considered if we use this method here. However, however, one thing you can be sure about is um, you are using the longest time and the largest current that I don't think that's the point that we can argue. So maybe conservative here means that we will come up with a value which is higher than what e, the one the, what the arc flash incident energy in real life is. Uh, so that's what the conservative means here. Now, I mean, some people might agree, some people may not agree that this is a good approach, but this is one approach. This is something we can do to calculate the incident energy. Um, if you go and calculate the, uh, let's say, um, calculate the incident energy to, through this way, what you have been neglecting, what the facts that you have not considered is that, um, I go back to the scenario that I set up here, it's just that, you know, um, I, I assume that this is the one that takes longest. You have to go and look at the TCCs and figure out uh, which device really takes the longest. But let's assume this takes the longest to trip and these three devices trip prior to the trip time of R1. Um, what happens is that I, I pick up this value as the R king current on this bus and this trip time and calculate the incident energy. How do I do that? The equations that come from the code, what code? We made that this you know, discussion just a few slides back and 1584 could be that code. Um, the other way is to go and look at the real value of the current and real behavior of the current after each trip device trips, that um, looks to be much more realistic approach. And that's what we in easy power we call as integrated method. Uh, something that if a device trips, we update the entire currents and look at the trip time, the updated trip time for other devices, because every time a, tri a device trips, the current in other branches might change, might change. If it doesn't, we still go through that iteration and keep, you know, come up with the same trip time for other devices. If it does, we would update all trip devices trip time. So let me just continue with this slide now. Um, 
Okay, this is a this is just a illustration of the concept that I explained earlier. Um, let's say you have a fault here. This is the voltage of this bus, and you put percentage number on the contribution depending the depending on the short circuit contribution. So um, I would say, okay, this guy contributes 10%, 5%, 80%, 5% here. They add up, as you notice, they all add up to 100%. So whatever short circuit current I have here. Then I can use the same percentage values after I calculated the arcing current on this bus. So I have the bolted fault current here, calculate the arcing current, and then after I calculated the arcing current, I would go and use these percentage values to calculate the arcing current contribution for each branch using these values. And then I can use that value to calculate the trip, trip device times. So and I covered it before. This is one method. The other method, there are other methods. Once you have the arcing current on the bus, then maybe you can look at the impedance values of all the branches and calculate the, you know, as you put a current source here and use some of the common methods in, in power systems and calculate the contribution from each branch. That could be another option. And you might come up, anybody can come up with other reasonable approaches, but this is the first one that comes to, any, to everybody's mind, that because the short circuit values are already calculated, if you do calculate them and they are already there, it's very easy to calculate this percentage. And it's reasonable and to some degree is realistic to, to use these values to calculate the arcing current values. But this is not the point and focus of this presentation. Uh, I'm just laying out that what other options, what different options are, what are the advantages, disadvantages of different methods. Once you do that, then you calculate the trip times. Once you have the trip times, then it comes to calculate the incident energy. And the main point is that I mentioned it before, you can calculate the longest trip time and calculate the incident energy, or you can imagine or you can assume or you can come up with a mechanism that when each trip device trips or each motor or generator turns off, it stops contributing, you take them into consideration while you're doing this incident energy calculation. That's what we refer to as integrated method. And that's what I would cover a little bit more in details uh, in a uh, few slides after this. So. Arc flash calculations. In a branch with series devices, the time for the fastest device can be used as the trip time. This has to be the basic for any arc flash calculation. If you have two trip devices which are in series, as soon as one of them trips, the, the, the branch contribution goes immediately to zero. That's, I don't think any further explanation is needed here. One of them opens and there would be the path for the current from that branch is zero is completely cut, broken. All these different algorithms will use the fault current as a fixed value to calculate the trip time. So for all different methods that we refer to, and I say different methods, maybe I have to explain it here. Um, let's say that if you wanted to use half a cycle or uh, five cycle or 30 cycle, once you go and calculate the trip time, so this is a new concept that we do consider it in integrated method, but other methods may not have it. Let's say if I go here and calculate my five cycle values, then I go calculate my 30 cycle values for, I have my bolted fault current, then I calculate my arcing current, then I come up with a method to come up to know the contribution from different branches. After that, I calculate the trip time. There is a little detail that I again missed here, and that's the fact that um, if this device, let's say, is, is tripping, let's say, in 9 cycle, 10 cycle, 12 cycle, th or 30 cycle, or more, even if nothing else in this setup has changed, the current and, and devices that contribute to this point, to this bus, their currents change because of the nature of the rotating devices and all the devices that except for a stiff grid like a utility that I discussed earlier, if you have motors and generators, these guys, their contribution to the fault varies over the time. It changes over the time. It drops this contribution as the time goes by, as the time progresses, this contribution comes down. So 
the fact that I didn't mention here is that I calculated, you know, five cycle or 30 cycle value here, and I assume that it is fixed regardless of the trip time of this device. It is not true. In real life, that's not the fact. In real life, this current would change. Even if no, so two factors that are being, so little by little, when I go through all this method, I highlight their deficiency. And then eventually I'm going to come up with why we would need integrated method and what integrated method offers that the, offer, the, the other methods won't. So here I have 15.984 and I calculate those currents and then I come up with the arcing currents and I put them in the TCC for all devices and I calculate the trip time. And then eventually again, it becomes the longest or slowest trip time. And then we can, ask the question from ourselves that does really this current remain the same regardless of the trip time for this and the answer is no it would change if the trip time is let's say more than 40 cycle this is a contribution which is valid for uh, anything larger than 8 cycle to 30 cycle so if the trip time of this device is 2 cycle this value, this value doesn't even apply. If this device trips in two cycle, the short circuit current here is larger than this value. Bottom line, if we need a method that can go and dynamically look at the trip time of the devices and update the currents instead of assuming one current and putting that current in the TCC of all other devices. So that's one other thing that integrated method considers. So far, two highlights, two big points that we discussed. Number one, there, you can easily assume that the short circuit current or contribution on this bus remains the same and then pick this value with the longest trip time and use it to calculate the incident energy, which has a lot of deficiencies. Or you can go and then in each iteration, look at what branches have stopped contributing and then take them off. Just delete them, remove them from the rest of the calculation. The other point is that if you want to go with a fixed short circuit current, you have to pick up either half cycle, five cycle, or 30 cycle. Once you pick one of these, these are regardless of the trip time of that device. The fact of the matter is that these short circuit currents, they change depending on when this device trips. If I pick half a cycle current contribution and calculate all the trip times, and then the trip time of this device is 45 cycles, we would know that this number doesn't apply because that number is valid only during the first cycle of calculation. So keep these two points in mind, and then let me go a little bit further and then see how these issues are covered in integrated method. So all these different algorithms will use the fault current as a fixed value to calculate the trip time. If a bus has three branches connected to it, we calculate the longest trip time and use it with the total fault current to get the incident energy. This has a flaw and we covered it very well so far. Number one, the current on the bus doesn't remain the same. As devices trip, this current changes. Number two, you, you better come up with a system or a method or an approach or an algorithm, however you call it, that considers the change of current only because of the time progression, nothing else. We all know that the current change because of current changes because of the motors, mo motors drop, um, dropping by or protective devices tripping. But other than that, if nothing else in that circuit, in that one line, in that setup doesn't change, if nothing else changes, the current by itself would change. So the approach has to somehow capture that change. In other words, it has to be an iterative method that once it goes beyond a certain threshold, let's say five cycle or eight cycle or nine cycle, automatically it would update all the current values and then plug them in, plug in the new values to calculate the new trip times. Let's see how this integrated method or let's see how this new method, integrated method, covers all these issues that I talked about so far. Let's consider a scenario in which we calculate a trip time for the branch whose time is the longest. 
by the time two other branches again because I have explained all these things with all the examples I just read through and move forward so that we get to the next step the next point by the time two other branches trip the total fault currents has significantly dropped in the meanwhile if there are two if there are motors or generators in that branch chances are they have stopped contributing to the fault as well in summary integrated method will consider above mentioned changes so any change due to a device dropping off or due to a protective device tripping will be considered now let's go and look at integrated method compare it against five cycle and 30 cycle here so now the integrated method looks at the arcing current on the on the integrated current integrated method looks at the arcing current on the faulted bus and integrates it over the time before I go more into details, let me explain what the um, integrated method will do here. So what happens is that it starts with iteration. It starts with a small delta t, a small time step, and it starts going through an iterative method. That iterative method is key to cover or to address all the deficiencies which I already pointed out associated with the rest of the other methods being momentary or half cycle or momentary or half cycle or five cycle or 30 cycles so we start with the iterative method we go through the same iteration and calculate the bolted fault can let's say that iteration is from zero to delta t we go there calculate this current calculated uh, from bolted fault current to the arcing current calculate the current contribution from branches and calculate the trip times for these guys so now let's say trip time of this guy is you know five cycle this guy becomes six cycle this becomes two cycle delta t hasn't got to that value but we keep it in a memory and i would explain how that how close i am to that trip time and then i keep it i store all those values i go to the second step during that second step and third step and fourth step, I have a chance to update the short default currents, meaning that if I pass half cycle or one cycle and I move in into I move into five cycle area, I would update all my current or fault currents based on the time. And also I have a chance to look at the status of all protective devices and take those which are already tripped off remove them and make their contribution zero so this iterative method otherwise known as integrated method will start looking at all these changes of the current over the time and calculates the current value which happens to be a, a variable value now it, you would expect that it's going to change over the time if you could plot it so that's how much i cover it for now let's just go a little bit more and look at the exams but eventually there would be a time that this current goes entirely to zero then you can go back and integrate that current over the time or you can go and calculate the incident energy for each step and then add them up and that would become your total incident energy for the, the you, that would become your entire incident energy then so now let me just go back here so the integrated method uh, looks at the arcing current of the faulted bus and integrates it over the time we take into consideration the arcing current changes over the time it also revises the trip time for each device if machines stop contributing as the name of the method suggests it's a numerical approach to integrating current over the time now let's take a look at this graph that makes it much more clear and um, easier to understand um, forget about what trip device trips but this is the this is the piecewise linear uh, simulation of the behavior of the real current the rear current fault current in a power system looks very much like this so it starts dropping and dropping and dropping up to a moment that it reaches a steady state value and it stays there forget about what protective device we have here for now but for that, this would be a nice, good piecewise linear 
approach uh, approximation of this curve so we would say up to this moment which is the first cycle the current remains here then it drops to a different value and then it drops to even a lower value for anything larger than h cycle or higher than that so this is the behavior of the current this is something that we can implement if we use this integrated method because we go through iterations and when i'm going through iterations let's say my delta t um, delta T1, delta T2, delta T3, and once that I pass this threshold immediately, the engine would replace all the currents, short circuit fault current values, with this value. Now, in a whole lot of new things have to be updated here. As an example, if you have trip devices, they used to see this value, now they see this value. They used to have a much shorter trip, trip time, now they have a longer trip time. But once they were if they haven't tripped already and if they already tripped then i would take them off i would entirely remove them if they are still connected then i i have a memory and i know that how much current they used to see and how much they have got close to their final trip time we have a mechanism to to keep track of that one because it's a protective device it works based on the current and as long as the current hasn't dropped below the pickup value it is still is counting it's counting and it's seeing a lower value for the current so it's counting in a slower rate but it is still counting and if we, if it reaches to the point that um, it has to trip then we have that value and it trip and it trips and it it just you know we take off that branch so now, let's take a look at those threshold values. For any time is smaller than one cycle, easy power uses momentary current for the calculations. Values larger than one cycle to eight cycle, easy power uses interrupting current for the calculations. Greater than eight cycle, easy power uses very cycle current for calculation. Let's take a quick look here, just to clarify this concept before I move on. And I still I haven't got to the real examples, but um, so as we are going through these iterations, different, you know, it's an iterative method, we go through delta T, let's say delta T is quarter cycle or one tenth or um, one to minus three um, second or any value. It's the software decides about that value. That's something in the software. It's not a user defined value, but as time progresses, um, it goes and every time compares where we are. Are we here or are we here or are we here? If we are here, this, the engine will use the momentary current. If we are here, the engine will use interrupting currents. If we are here, the engine will use theory cycle values. So, and in the meanwhile, and in the meanwhile, as it um, goes on, this iteration and this, you know, calculation repetitive um, approach, it just, you know, kind of goes through the same cycle. Any of these uh, trip devices that open up, it would take that branch off, make that contribution zero. I kind of touched on the topic of we have a memory of, you know, uh, knowing how this trip device or how much this trip device has moved already. This is a little bit in line and it's easier to explain if you look at the mechanical, electromechanical relays in the past that they had disks. And that's much easier if I wanted to kind of, you know, explain it that way. That disk has to make a rotation. It has to... A, a travel a certain distance before it uh, trips and it's very easy to explain it this way that you know if that disk um, is seeing this current it's moving faster then it moves a slower and moves the slowest at this current but what happens is that if it has seen this current and has made it to the second round or to the interrupting current uh, area there is a memory we, we know that it has moved a little bit and we keep that in the memory and we add it up here until it reaches the final distance um you know it it it, it passes that final point and it has traveled that distance and it trips then that's the point that that trip device um trip trips entirely now let me just move on here we went over these times right now this is, it's a very simple language, and this is just a mathematical um, explanation of what I just explained. Um, for each trip device, 
let's call uh, let's call our travel time delta t divided by this where does it come from this comes from let's say if we are in the first iteration so this is one delta t is a defined value let's say one two minus five how is that one two minus five divided by this value where does it come from this comes from here um, because it's the first iteration we are in the half a cycle area so half a cycle current here we need to have it then half a cycle current calculated then from the bolted fault current of this half cycle current uh, this is the branch uh, this is the bolted fault current contribution we need to calculate the arcing current contribution so the arcing current contribution gets calculated and this that's in the half cycle area then you put it in the TCC of this relay it gives you a time that time is this time so 1 to minus 5 divided by that trip time is a fraction it's it's a number it's less than 1 though if it becomes if it becomes larger than 1 or 1 that's the time that the, the relay has to trip so I'm assuming it's less than 1 but I keep it in the memory of that software easy part keeps it in its memory for the second iteration so eventually the time this this addition of all these values whenever it reaches one or it passes one that's when that device trips so if you go through the all this iteration one by one we change the currents if we go from the area of um, here to here um, based on these threshold values and then we add them up so uh, then eventually whenever this value gets close to one then or it gets one that's when this device trips one easy way of understanding is that let's say that it, this device is supposed to trip in less than one cycle so the current doesn't change at all this is very easy to understand because it would become delta t divided by the same value it doesn't change so you know you would need that many iterations which is this ratio for example if this value is one second and this is one to minus three you would need thousand iteration right you would need thousand iteration until it becomes one because this value is not going to change it remains the same and then eventually it becomes one but half we have to make sure that it doesn't exceed half cycle half cycle obviously is eight millisecond so you know the example that i said that this is one um one second that contradicts that con concept so I just want, don't want to make it co complicated the easy way of explaining is that we put it in a fraction and add these fractions and eventually whenever it becomes one that's when the, the relay has traveled the distance and it's ready to trip and it will trip and this is the same thing this these two are completely the same so our travel is addition of all these fractions so this might become one third then one third um, we add them up and eventually whenever it's one then the relay trips now going back to the next slide easy power has used this approach in real life cases and has got satisfactory results this method seems easy to understand but it's complex when it comes to coding and implementation in a large software package let's take a look at the system that was modeled in easy power based on the common data used in renewable plants for wind generation again I use this example because I have used similar example in my previous webinars but there is no limitation it's just an electrical system any electrical system any system any type of energy this integrated method can be easily conveniently used let's take a look this is the system here and I have it ready in fact we look at the results together let me close this one save now save it it's open here the file let me do this one and go okay so everything is ready here say no then come back okay it's it's very much the file that I prepared here then five renewable sources of energy are here uh, a step up transformer utility uh, this one is a transformer of 34 5 
is a transformer of 34.5 to 138. These are all identical transformer. These are all identical generators. They all are in PV mode. We have a swing source here. So it's a small setup that is, it, it kind of simulates the setup that we have for renewables in many cases. You can take a look at the editor page of these generators as well. Rated KV, power factor, rating value, power flow. These are in PQ modes. Uh, impedance values are given. Let me just take it to the other side. Okay, so this is a screenshot of the same system. I mean, we already saw the system live, so. The system is only an example of application of the method in a simulation package. There are five wind turbines that are modeled as PQ source. The modeling is the simplest possible to demonstrate a short circuit situation. Protective devices are some typical devices used only for purpose of arc flash study application. Turbines all, all assumed to be 2 megawatt. There are step up transformers for each turbine. Uh, all transformers are 2 MVA. Impedance is 9%. There are plenty of internal protective devices. Uh, I meant in real life, in fact, which weren't modeled here. As we are looking at only 5051 function, like any other arc flash study, this can be tri type 3. I have covered them in detail. They're really not the focus of this presentation, but they can potentially be type three or d turbines for those who are um, you know, more familiar with the type of wind turbines. But otherwise, I just use the synchronous machine, just a simple synchronous machine to model that in easy power. Comparison of the different methods. Now, we performed the arc flash study once with the regular method using momentary current, and again using the improved method or integrated method. The table for comparing both methods are given side by side in the next slide. We can't make a conclusion on whether or not the incident energy will always go down or up as it depends. And it might go back again to the heart of that term of conservative, but you might get the picture or assumption that whenever we use the in integrated method, the incident energy has to go down. This is not the fact this is not in fact a correct assumption it can go either ways however most of the time yes the current goes down because of the nature of the current uh, coming down as the time progresses but you might see scenarios in which the incident energy goes up and those scenarios are where you have a, a protective device which trips and when that protective device trips um, the current becomes significantly lower and other protective devices take much longer to trip. And even though the current has come down, but the time goes up um, so much as it very much um, makes up for the uh, current decrease and eventually the calculated incident energy becomes higher. So the point is, don't, let's not make an assumption just using the integrated method will decrease the incident energy. That is not the case. Now, the table here, you can see the incident energy, and I'm just, in a minute, I will show the real value and I will run it on easy power, but on different buses, I just ran it on the buses which are lower voltage, so I did not run it on the buses, uh, buses of 15 kV or higher as uh, 1584 doesn't really apply. So. Uh, you will see bus 2 uh, values, incident energy values. These are for momentary calculation, and this is for integrated calculation. As you see, the incident energy has come down, and very obvious that the arc flash boundary will decrease as well. But let's take a look at the system here. I am going to go to short circuit here, choose integrated method, click OK, come back, choose this guy. This guy, this guy, all the voltage, low voltage buses, as I said, um, this is 690 level, 690 volt, this becomes 34.5, all this area, and then it goes to 230. So I come back, fault buses, uh, look at the arc flash values, 311.379.9. Uh, and you can see that here. So these are the results of the um, instant energy using using integrated method. Let me just go back and use the momentary method here. Apply 503, 162.4, 503, 162.4 here. 
so um and again because the system has a symmetry everything has um i use uh, identical machines in this example so you would see that these results repeat themselves very much for all five branches in the next example i used a system with two large motors and that system doesn't have the symmetry that this one does uh, we will go a little bit more detail and we look at the results make the comparison and after that i come to uh, the you know con conclusion part and you know kind of uh, finish up the work finish up the presentation right after that so um, here we saw the results and the values as you can see and you know very brief uh, if I go to again momentary uh, you would expect to see the momentary current values here 29.625 for these buses let's take a look as you can see for the bus these are momentary values if you use interrupting current to calculate the incident energy you would see those values here so here for the the, the one point that we get a lot of questions from our users is that um, when you go to integrated method depending on the trip time you can get a current which is equal equal to your five half cycle five cycle or 30 cycle because again the point that we mentioned the whole point of using an integrated method was that we didn't want to assume a fixed current for the short circuit we mentioned that we want to change the current as the time progresses so we pass the threshold of one cycle uh, we change and update the values uh, from half a cycle to five cycle we pass the threshold of uh, five cycle uh, we go to uh, five cycle uh, threshold of the uh, five cycle to eight cycle then we use the five cycle values and we go beyond eight cycle as you remember from my slide here then we use the 30 cycle currents values so you can see any of these values on your integrated method depending on the last trip device trip time if that trip device tripped within half cycle you would expect to see the half cycle short circuit values in your results if that trip device div uh, tripped something within this area then you would see five circuit that's a big difference that you would notice between momentary interrupting theory cycle versus integrated method so for integrated method you can see any of those values so again I already verified it that if I use momentary values I would see the momentary values in the table versus here if I go to my integrated method and I run my integrated method uh, for example here um, I see 29.6 which is my half cycle now let's go and take a look at my trip time so it you would see the pink values which is clearly saying that uh, easy power is picking the 85 percent values um i don't I, we have gone through details of that you know 100 percent versus 85 percent value this is a 85 percent value that's why you see the pink values but let's take a look at the arc time just the trip time um so the trip time here is arc time is 2.3 seconds so it's larger than 30 cycles so let's go back and look at these values here I have two and bolted fault current of 29 point choose this and this and this and this and I have chosen integrated method fault them and the values that now I'm seeing here bolted fault current is 15.5 15 15.5232 15 it is not half cycle it is not there is it is not five cycle it is though my 30 cycle value then i put it in line with my trip time which is equal to two point it's obviously larger than 30 cycle is something two second is something closer to 120 cycle so that's why you would see this current here which is a 30 cycle value here if this trip time was let's say one cycle or it was 0.9 cycle you would definitely have seen half cycle value here because this is an integrated method but if you go and choose a momentary or 30 cycle 
you would see only that momentary ortho recycle and the software and the engine does not update it. it uses one value one unique value calculates all the trip value the trip times based on that but he, and doesn't change it based on the trip time the advantage of the integrated method is that it goes through the iterations and if that iterations and the number of times goes beyond the recycle the current gets updated to the recycle automatic automatically and you would see that here how it gets done we covered it and we discussed it before but i can go back and this is the slide that the trip time gets calculated from these um, numbers so every time that we go through the first iteration i is one so we use the time step divided by the trip time for that time step we go to the second iteration we update this value if it needs an update otherwise it remains the same we would we would we add this value plus delta t r trip 2 plus we continue this process until this value becomes one or exceeds one that's where the relay trips so now let's take a look at the second example i have here so the second example i have here i'm gonna close this guy don't save it and go back and open my second example so second example it doesn't have the symmetry that we have before we had before so i'm gonna fault this guy here go to short circuit use my momentary method first i click ok fault the boss and uh, look at the values uh, 88.1 5.6 this is integrated method let me just go first to momentary values 88.1 5.6 this is a momentary report as you can see i go to arc flash results arc flash results if i run half a cycle momentary uh, 23.386 that's what you're looking for you see it here everything is momentary the trip time the current is re remain remains the same if i go back and i go to integrated method here apply okay and here now the value becomes um, for the integrated method the value becomes bus bolted fault uh, 20.814 branch uh, so here this is my half cycle value, five cycle, and 30 cycle. It seems that this value is very much with my, in line with my five cycle. That tells me the trip time has to be something larger than one, smaller than eight cycle, according to what we had in the past. So let's go take a look at the trip time for integrated method. And arc time is, uh, zero nine four let's see how many cycles is that that's 5.64 cycle that's exactly within what we expected five cycle area that's why we see the five cycle value here so it started from the um, time zero went through iterations one second third fourth and it passed once it passed the first cycle then it updates the short circuit fault current values it goes on till the um, beginning of the eight cycle then if we would have gone beyond eight cycle you would have seen the value of 30 cycle value here which is not the case here because for that case this trip time should have been larger than eight cycle which doesn't happen here it's closer almost to six cycle here so that's why for integrated method you see this value so we covered this one in details too. So this, this is this is one of the very frequently uh, this is one of the frequently asked questions from a lot of our users that they ask about this discrepancy. You you can see different values depending on the trip time for integrated integrated method. That's the advantage of this method, and let's keep that one in mind. Now, conclusion: in order to come up with an algorithm or approach or method to calculate arc flash instant energy we need to find some numerical methods that i gave some background in terms of how different softwares different packages approach it we can use the total arc in can and the longest trip time to come up with the conservative method again this conservative method could be a controversial um, term but i clear i clarified that what i mean by conservative method it tends to 
give us much higher values for the incident energy when we assume that the arc current on the bus remains the same and also we use the longest trip time as the um, you know duration of the fault on that bus we went over the reasons that why it's not a very realistic method because by the time the last trip device trips there are other trip devices that have already tripped and the current on that bus doesn't remain the same so one improvement to this method can be to include the arcing current decrements due to switchings. So integrated method comes up with, a, with an iterative approach, which goes through iterations. A step-by-step -step goes through this little delta, delta T's and um, sees if any device has tripped, it takes it off. It completely eliminates that branch. If um, the time has gone beyond one cycle or um, eight or uh, uh, it goes beyond yeah uh, one cycle then it uh, from one to, from zero to one cycle it uses the half a cycle from two to eight cycle it uses five cycle and beyond eight cycle it uses the 30 cycle values and it updates the current that's a very big a strong point about the integrated method that it updates the current in the engine as it continues this simulation so the approach can be improved further by including the changes of the current over the time due to the impedance changes in the system. That means, this, so this is one step further if we wanted to go one step further. If you remember that piecewise linear uh, approach of the decaying curve, we can, instead of algebraic equation, we can really solve some differential equations and come up with the real decaying curve instead of a piecewise linear. So that would be one step uh, improvement of the system, which I have to mention that is already implemented in our dynamic stability module. Uh, I have a few um, presentation and webinars on that module as well, but for here and for the purpose of this discussion, I used our, sh or our short circuit engine and arc flash engine here, which doesn't solve differential equation it only deals with um, algebraic equations. In general, the method is one step closer to real life and provides more reliable results. That being said, I need to mention one more thing before I um, finish up the presentation. Um, the concept and this presentation, I used my recent presentation on improved arc flash energy calculation method and its application in the renewable energy design. It was presented at ESW, IEEE ESW event in Reno, Nevada in February or March, um, end of February, March 2017. Um, but I went a lot more into details of the easy parts. But as a reference, I just wanted to mention that um, I have used that presentation, which was uh, presented back in February in, at ESW. But other than that, examples and easy power screen captures, those are all the additions and it makes it much easier to follow and, uh, and understand. I hope that it helped uh, your um, understanding about our integrated method and it addresses the questions you guys have. Uh, for any further question, I'll be happy to help. You can either uh, email me at afshin at easypower.com or um, call us directly and ask for uh, me. My extension is 61 here. And, or you can call our technical support department and ask for my name, which again, the phone will be uh, directed to me. But anyhow, uh, I will be happy to help. If there is a question, just send us an email or give me a call. I'll be happy to discuss it. Uh, this method uh, by far goes uh, beyond momentary half cycle, 30 cycle uh, a scope of uh, work a scope of coverage, I would say, and it's much more realistic. It's closer to real life results. That being said, thank you very much for your time. And I appreciate everybody's following the topic and I'll be happy to help if there is any question. Have a good day and bye.